For much of human history, mankind has had a few constants that have seemingly perpetually stayed with us throughout our entire existence. Number one, dogs, man's best friend. And to go right along with our best friend would be the need to get fucked up after a long, hard day's work. Making number two, alcohol. Throughout history, mankind has had a rich and fascinating relationship with alcohol. From it being important to our religious ceremonies, as well as being a staple in just about every other cultural event we humans put on to celebrate something. Alcohol, whether you hate it or love it, is intrinsically tied to us humans. And so today on Historical Quarrels, we go over not just the history of alcohol, but some of the conflicts as generated between us humans as well, such as the famous whiskey wars. So sit back, and as long as you aren't driving, grab a brewski to sip on as we dive into today's historical quarrel. Welcome back. I am your host, Tyler Eckhart, and you can bet your sweet mama you are listening to historical quarrels. Hopefully my dumb little Elvis impersonation didn't deter you uh, new listeners from continuing on, because today's episode will be a fun one. Uh, We are going over the whiskey wars. um, Well, really the history of alcohol and the impact it has had on human history. And so I'm I'm pretty excited for you guys. It's going to be a fun one. I uh, did a bunch of research on this one after a listener and friend of the show, Mike Ritz, had suggested Whiskey Wars be a topic. As I was researching it, I just kept asking, like, well, you know, how long have humans really been drinking, drinking the brewskis? And, uh, you know, what else have we done with it? What else does it cost? And so <clears throat> today in total, more than just the Whiskey Wars, we're really exploring the history of it and the history of just some conflicts, um, really starting with the uh, post American revolution into some of the, (laughs) the prohibition era as well. And then finishing today off with the whiskey wars. So besides that couple quick announcements for you guys, before we dive into everything, number one, If you are a fan of the other podcast that I do, Hard Homies, I am happy to announce that we are finally coming back uh, next week in full force. We'll have a full episode out again. I'm sorry for the couple of weeks that it has been delayed, essentially, and uh, (laughs) the less than stellar audio quality on a couple of the past episodes. Uh, That's uh, that's on me. I'm the primary audio editor and... uh, just did not have the time to go and try and figure out how to down, like separate audio tracks from the games and everything from the VOD that they sent me. So uh, I could have done that, but I didn't. <laughs> so apologies there. Uh, but yeah, full episode out next week. Uh, we're getting back into the swing of things now that my buddy's done moving. So uh, second announcement is I love you guys. Just love you guys. Eh, it's really cool. Um, <laughs> no, uh, we have begun preliminary designs on some merch ideas. If you guys have thoughts on what you would like merch for the show to be, uh, let me know. Um, I I already have someone in mind that I'll probably go talk to. Uh, Once we do start rolling out merch, it's probably like another year or so out though, before we really start doing it. But because we are talking about it, it'd be nice to have some ideas. So if you have any ideas, please email me at historicalquarrels at gmail.com. Um, just ideas that you guys have. Uh, so then we can start putting it to paper and start kind of, you know, fucking around with it a little bit. Um, but yeah, so if you're sipping on your brewski and you're ready for today's episode, let's go ahead and, uh, dive into it. Shall we? You are listening to historical quarrels. The history of alcohol dates back to the earliest civilizations. Archaeological evidence suggests that humans have been fermenting beverages for over 9,000 years. And is it just me or does does it kind of feel weird that we don't have like music playing as a talk about beer? You know, like like some like low country tones or like some like some like folksy music. I'm going to go ahead. Go ahead and play that uh, right right now as we uh, go ahead and get that started. Let's go ahead and uh, go ahead and 
Oops, press this right here and uh, right now. Ah, there we go. Yep, yep. Oh, that's that's the shit. Mm. All right, let's let's continue. That's right. I've always loved getting fucked up. Basically, since the dawn of civilization, the first known alcoholic drink, fermented mixture of rice, honey, and fruit. Ooh, ooh, basically mead right there. It's uh, rice mead. Was discovered in Jiahu. China, dating back to around 7,000 BCE. In Mesopotamia, the Sumerians brewed beer as early as 4,000 BCE, with recipes inscribed on clay tablets. Alcohol played a central role in religious and social rituals, highlighting its cultural significance, much as it does today, in today's day, you know, day and time. If uh, you want to go out and celebrate with uh, your friends, like you get promoted, you go out and usually grab some beers. Um, unless you're Mormon, then you don't do that. And you... Um, you really don't have real friends, so you just kind of cry a little bit. <laughs> I'm kidding. No, no, you just hang out and you play board games. I know how it is. Or uh, you have dinner or something. You can have fun without drinking, but uh, everywhere else outside of Utah, this is the standard. You go out and grab some beers. Or, you know, if you're not into beers like me, you go out and you uh, grab, you know, some fruity drinks, some, uh, some uh, cocktails, because cocktails are... Uh, taste a hundred thousand times better than beer. God damn it. Anyways, <clears throat> ancient Egyptians were also fond of beer, which was a staple in their diet. Workers who built the pyramids were often paid in beer, receiving rations of up to four liters a day. God damn. Talking about getting drunk on the job, man. That's uh, it's fucking awesome. Wine was reserved for the elite and used in religious ceremonies as wine is still kind of today. If you want a fucking good wine or, you know, like fancy wine, it's expensive as all hell. So, you know, for the elite. And uh, if you go to the Catholic Church, if you're Catholic, you, you, you take a little bit of wine when uh, you take the sacrament. Or, um, uh, yeah, well, what, what, it, what they consider the sacrament to be. So, you know, <clears throat> the Egyptians believed that the god Osiris taught humans the art of winemaking, underscoring the alcohol's divine connections much like how Bacchus taught the Greeks how to make wine. Uh, no, not Bacchus, uh, Di Dionysus. Sorry, I was thinking Romans. Uh, Romans there, so, so. The Greeks and the Romans further developed the production and consumption of alcohol. The Greeks preferred wine, which was often diluted with water. Drinking undiluted wine was considered barbaric. Like, how, how could you? This is horrible. <laughs> drinking undiluted wine? You, you animal? <laughs> The Greeks held symposiums, social gatherings, where phil phil philosophical discussions and drinking games took place. You know, again, very much like modern days. Uh, one such event, recounted by the historian Herodotus, involved a group of Greeks who, after consuming copious amounts of wine, attempted to plow a field with human strength alone. That's right, they got so fucked up they thought they could do that. In ancient Rome, alcohol was ubiquitous. The Romans adopted Greek wine culture, but took it to the new heights, uh, <clears throat> like excess heights with lavish uh, um, Bacchanalian feasts dedicated to Bacchus, the god of wine. These events were so excessive that they eventually faced restrictions by the Roman Senate in an attempt to curb public disorder. People got a little too rowdy, having a little too much fun. Roman soldiers were also known for their heavy drinking sometimes leading to unintended consequences during military campaigns. Yeah, probably because, like, watching your best friend get his head chopped off or, like, eaten alive by some, you know, German barbarian. It definitely, definitely want to cause you to want to, like, forget that. And, you know, uh, the best way to try and forget was drinking back then. They didn't have a lot of other options. So, yeah, that just sounds <laughs> like very standard veteran alcoholic response. One of the most humorous military anecdotes involving alcohol comes from the campaigns of Alexander the Great uh, during the Siege of Tyre in 332 BCE. Uh, this is an event that I've actually covered. Two of Alexander's men, Theodorus uh, and Aristander, got heavily intoxicated and decided to scale the city walls. Their unexpected action caused confusion and panic among the defenders, leading to a breach that contributed to the Macedonian victory. Uh, so, you know, to... Two dumbasses got drunk together. They're like, we, oh, we could go fucking take over the city. And they fucking did it. Um, this is this incident illustrates how alcohol-induced bravado can sometimes turn the tide of battle. 
Um, and also just, you know, make you look like a jackass <laughs> climbing a wall. <laughs> Your enemy's like, what the fuck? Why is there only two of them? What? No, the oh, no, this is, they're probably trying to route us. They're probably, they went around the back. That's where the main army is. <laughs> just, it's a fake out. In medieval Europe, monasteries became centers of brewing and winemaking. Monks re uh, refined brewing techniques, producing high quality beer and wine. They viewed their brewing activities as a form of labor that supported their communities and funded their religious activities. Ah, good old, good old monk wine, and monk beer. Some of the oldest existing breweries in Europe, such as uh, Wehenstefan Abbey in Bavaria, trace their origins back to the monastic traditions. The Renaissance saw a revival in the art of winemaking, particularly in Italy and France. Wine became a symbol of cultural uh, of culture and refinement, <clears throat> and its consumption was integral to the social life of the elite. Uh, <laughs> it still is today. A uh, buddy, buddy of mine, a uh, good, good friend of mine, uh, many of you guys probably know him, uh, Will XX. Uh, he went to ta Italy a while ago. <laughs> Uh, they wine is wine drinking is still definitely part of the culture. He was saying because like he's you know he d he doesn't drink for personal reasons. And <laughs> when he told the waiter that they're like even wine, <laughs> it's just because like that's how ingrained <laughs> they don't even think of wine as like like beer or like an alcohol like an alcoholic drink. It's just it's basically juice for them. <laughs> Leonardo da Vinci, a renowned polymath, uh, polymath, and even. <clears throat> he he even designed innovative wine presses to improve production. That's how fucking Italian this guy was. This period also saw the introduction of distilled spirits. Oh, by the way, if you haven't checked out Will XX uh, tattoo and you guys live in Texas, uh, specifically San Antonio, please go check him out. Go hit him up. Amazing, amazing tattoo artist. One of the the best. I he's gonna hate me for saying this, but probably one of the best in the world. Like the guy is. The guy is incredible. Like he has an artistic gift. Uh, you know, I, I'm just absolutely stunned by the work that he's done. He, he's like my whole family will have tattoos from, uh, from him. Well, sorry, my wife's family, the the family I married into, all of us got tattoos from him. So, um, and if you're in Utah and you know he's here, definitely hit him up or um, Lauren, his apprentice, and Diego at uh, <clears throat> it's Dead Inside Studio. At Dead Inside Studio. Go check them out. They're dope. They're awesome artists. I, I've got tattoos from Lauren and Diego. and They're, they're great. Wonderful. So it, it hit them up. Uh, it's uh, Carrie and Blossom for Diego and then Alluring Arts for Lauren. Okay. <clears throat> Anyways, zooming on. <laughs> this period saw the int uh, introduction of distilled spirits, which added a new dimension to alcohol consumption. In the 18th century England, the gin craze epitomized the social impact of alcohol. Cheap and potent gin became immensely popular among the urban poor. Good old fucking gin. Just, it's basically just European moonshine, <laughs> if you think about it, leading to widespread public drunkenness and social issues. William Hogarth's famous print, Gin Lane, vividly depicted the negative effects of gin consumption. In response, the government enacted a series of gin acts to regulate and curb its consumption. Man... Man, the man has always been trying to put us down with our drinking. Okay, listen, if, if we want to get fucked up in in an in, in insanely irresponsibly way, we should be allowed to. We got to fight back against that. America, we fucking, we did fight back against that in the prohibition. Okay. Uh, it's pretty much getting over there. Alcohol played a significant role in the American colonies. Rum distilled from molasses was a popular drink and crucial part of the triangular trade. Uh, the British imposed taxes on molasses, contributing to colonial discontent. That was, that was the true main reason of the American Revolution, was we couldn't get fucked up off of rum anymore. And I am a big rum guy, I'm not going to lie, I love rum. Mix that with some pineapple juice, oh, oh boy. Man, I got I got real fucked up at uh, Wet Hump Bad Magic Summer Camp. Uh, <laughs> just It was like unlimited drinks with your ticket, and I just kept going up to the the tent I was like, yeah, so I just need some pineapple juice and if you can mix it with the Malibu rum. And I apparently had done that because I got fucked up on other stuff too. Uh, but I apparently had done it so much that by the time I went back there, like the third or fourth time, they just had it prepared for me. <laughs> and, oh man, it was, uh, that was a crazy night. I don't think I'm ever going to party that hard again. Uh, I'm, 
I'm starting to feel age a little bit more. Yeah, I'm young, but like I'm starting to feel it. I, I feel like I can't I can't keep doing that. I don't have too many <laughs> more of those left in me. So <clears throat> anyway, <laughs> during the American Revolution, soldiers often received rum rations. The taverns became centers of revolutionary activity. George Washington's troops were famously issued a daily rum ration. Because George Washington liked to get fucked up, too. <laughs> the guy was a bit of an alcoholic. Uh, not not really. I mean, he but he did like he did like his rum as well, highlighting its importance for everyone. So <clears throat> and then the 20th century brought the prohibition era in the United States uh, with the manufacture, sale and transportation of alcohol were banned from 1920 to 1933. This would lead to the rise of speakeasies, illegal bars where people continued to drink in secret. The ban was intended to reduce crime and fight social problems, but instead fueled the growth of organized crime, which we are going to go over that extensively here in a little bit. As well as this part right here, because in 1791, the U.S. government also imposed attacks on distilled spirits, leading to wi the Whiskey Rebellion. And that's another that that will be the first one that we go over in our timeline. So we'll go over that a little bit later. But the Whiskey Rebellion is huge. And then in 1923, Adolf Hitler attempted a coup in Munich known as the Beer Hall Putsch, using a beer hall as the rallying point. Though the coup failed, it demonstrated how alcohol-related venues could become focal points for political movements. Um, not not only Hitler. <laughs> I'm just bringing that up because it was a, a again we're kind of moving along the timeline. It's, you know, it's people have used have used booze to get people you know rallied up. Vikings used to do it with mead all the time. You know, give give enough people mead and they'll fucking go raid a village easily. Get them get them drunk enough and. Yeah, they'll forget about the screams and the, you know, the faces being ripped off by them. Uh, in contemporary times, or modern day times, the craft beer movement has revitalized interest in brewing. Uh, small, independent breweries focus on traditional techniques and innovative flavors, leading to a renaissance in beer culture. This movement emphasizes quality over quantity and has created a global community of beer enthusiasts. Or is the Reddit... You know, it's really just the Reddit crowd. You know, the craft, the craft Reddits, r slash, r slash, brewing, or whatever the fuck it's called, where the snobby, over the top, you know, braggarts like to gather and be like, mm, "This beer has the fine, the finities of nut, <laughs> like just pure nut." And, you know, it's like those wine snobs, but like the wine snobs have money. So like the beer snobs are just poor and want to be the wine snobs, basically, is how I view it. Uh, if you are a beer snob, good for you. I don't, again, I'm not a big beer guy. More of a whiskey dude. I like whiskey. I like rum. More of a cocktail guy, really. And just uh, at the end of the day, that's, uh, that's where I'm at. Anyways. Alcohol has had a significant presence in literature and film, often symbolizing celebration, despair, you know, for alcoholics. Uh, and I come from a family uh, where I have a family member who's an alcoholic, and it's not its not fun. The despair part, not fun. It took me a long time to realize you could drink and, like, you know, have fun and giggle instead of just be sad. So, uh, or social bonding. You know, there's a lot of bonding to be had over a brewski. Uh, you, you know, you can you can uh, make an enemy into a friend drinking. OK, from the drinking bouts of Ernest Hemingway's characters to the iconic martinis of James Bond. Alcohol is a common motif. The comedic potential of alcohol is also frequently explored, seen in films like Animal House and The Hangover, where The Hangover is not necessarily just alcohol. They were drugged. They, they, they were roofied. <laughs> Went and did some crazy shit on, on roofies, basically. So, again, you know, this it's just, it's embedded into our culture. It's embedded into humanity itself, basically. The history of alcohol is rich and multifaceted, reflecting its integral, I mean integral role in human society. From ancient goddamn rituals to modern craft beer, which is basically an ancient ritual in itself i am positive those fuckers are casting spells into their fucking distilleries alcohol has influenced cultures economies and even historical events and while it has brought joy and camaraderie it has also posed challenges and sparked controversy 
So really, it is our goal today to understand this complex legacy and understand some of these very complex and um, intense events that have happened, uh, mainly the rebellion, the Whiskey Rebellion, the Prohibition, and the Whiskey Wars. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and do this and so we can appreciate the ways in which alcohol has shaped and continues to shape human civilization. And now, ladies and gents, let's hoof it down our historic timeline. <clears throat> In the early 1790s, the fledgling United States faced a monumental task, paying off the substantial debt accrued during the Revolutionary War. I'm talking so much debt, it would make you cry a little bit. Um, no, I'm kidding. I mean, <laughs> no, it was, it was pretty fucking bad. Um, and to address this financial crisis, uh, Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, Alexander motherfucking Hamilton, proposed a series of measures, one of which was the introduction of an ex- excise tax on distilled spirits. This tax, which became law in 1791, was part of Hamilton's broader plan to stabilize the nation's finances and establish federal authority over state and local governments, because he was more of a federalist. Hamilton's excise tax was seen as a critical step in his financial program. He believed that a strong central government with the ability to collect taxes was essential for the young nation to thrive. In his report... On <clears throat> In his report on public credit, Hamilton argued, It is essential that the public should entertain a strong sense of the necessity of maintaining the national faith by a provision for the public debt. Uh, in my opinion, is just a whole bunch of way, you know, just a bullshit way of saying, yeah, everyone needs to pay for this shit that we got into, okay? Listen, we don't know what the fuck we're doing. We need some money, and uh, you're all religious, and you're not supposed to be drinking anyways, <laughs> so... That's, at least that's how I viewed it. He viewed the tax on distilled spirits as a fair and efficient means of generating revenue, as whiskey production was widespread and its consumption was considerable. Everyone loved their whiskey back in the day, and still do today. The tax structure was designed to be progressive, with larger distillers paying a higher rate per gallon than smaller producers. Specifically, the tax rate was set at $0.07 cents per gallon for large distilleries and $0.09 cents per gallon for small operations. This Different uh, differentiation was intended to encourage economies of scale and efficient production methods. However, it also disproportionately affected small frontier distillers who were often just farmers distilling surplus grain into whiskey. <laughs> yeah, so most of you guys definitely did not have the fucking money to do it. For many, whiskey was not only a product, but a form of currency and an integral part of their economic life. Uh, it was uh, a way for them to be like, hey, listen, Joe, thanks for the cows. Here's like 10, 10 gallons of whiskey. <laughs> it's it like a trade, a sense of, you know, just like trading. The public reaction to the excise tax was mixed and highly regional. In the more urban and commercial centers of the East Coast, where Hamilton's policies enjoyed greater support, the tax was seen as a necessary measure for the greater good. And in contrast, in the rural and frontier areas where the small (laughs) distilleries uh, would be, particularly in western Pennsylvania, the tax was met with fierce resistance. Farmers and small distillers viewed the tax as an unfair burden imposed by a distant, unrepresentative government. You know, like the one that they just fought against, (laughs) like England. This sentiment was captured in a letter from a western Pennsylvanian farmer who wrote, the tax will fall most heavily on those who least able to bear it. And it is an affront to our liberty to be taxed by those who do not represent us. I swear to God, if I have to go through this shit again, <laughs> it just continues. That first part was true. <laughs> the whole, I swear to God, if I have to do this shit again was not, that was just me ad libbing. So, you know, don't, don't take that as a quote. Uh, <laughs> The logistical challenges of enforcing the tax only exacerbated the situation. The federal government lacked the infrastructure and manpower to effectively collect the tax in remote areas. Tax collectors, often seen as agents of federal (laughs) oppression, 
were met with hostility, intimidation, and sometimes just outright violence. They beat the shit out of them. In some cases, they were tarred and fucking feathered. Woo! Back in the day, back in the 1790s and the 1800s, they loved their tar and feathering. I swear to God, America was all about that shit, man. This was a practice that very vividly illustrates the depth of the local animosity towards these tax-collecting assholes. Hamilton, however, was undeterred by the resistance. He believed that enforcing the excise tax was crucial for not only for financial reasons, but also for establishing the authority of the federal government. In a letter to President George Washington, Hamilton emphasized the importance of upholding law. He says, a government without the power to enforce its laws is a government in name only. It is essential that we demonstrate the resolve to uphold the rule of law and ensured compl- and ensure compliance with the tax. He was also probably like, hey, George, we, we're, we're really fucked if we don't collect the money. Like, like we're, we're extra fucked if we don't get this money. This is, this is the, the easiest way that I can think of. Nobody else is shouting out any other ideas. So unless you can come up with something better, we really need to make sure that these fuckers start paying. <laughs> that was the real, the really what he wanted to say there. The introduction of this whiskey excise tax really sets the stage for a much larger conflict to come. Um, And in 1791 to 94, there is a stark growing resistance. With this widespread discontent among the farmers in Western Pennsylvania and other frontier regions, these farmers who often distilled again, their surplus grain into whiskey, just the extra grain that they had really viewed this tax as unjust as fuck. They, they thought this was just, you know, fucking King George all over again. Whiskey, again, was not just this commodity for the communities. It is a vital, vital part of their economy, serving as a medium of exchange and a profitable use of excess grain. It allowed them to make money off of shit that they were going to have to throw away anyways. You know, just like, you know, it's them being frugal and they're getting fucked over with it. <laughs> the tax threatened their livelihoods. So... <clears throat> this uh, this quickly escalated. So farmers were to organize meetings to voice their opposition and plan uh, <laughs> to plan collective actions. These gatherings often took place in taverns and other community centers where whiskey was a central feature of social and economic life. So a bunch of, you know, the bar owners who, you know, were selling the whiskey and these, uh, especially from these farmers who just distilled it just for shits and giggles. They're all meeting in there and being like, yeah, this is, this is fucked, man. I want George to, you know, be able to keep giving me his, you know, if he, he makes the finest shitty wheat, <laughs> wheat whiskey this far from this side of the Mississippi. Swear to God. <laughs> so they're upset about that. <clears throat> One of the earliest and most significant of these meetings occurred in Pittsburgh in 1791, where a group of farmers and distillers formed the Bingo Creek Association to coordinate their efforts against the tax. They adopted resolutions condemning the excise tax and calling for its repeal, arguing that it was unjust, oppressive, and unconstitutional. This took a more confrontational turn. Tax collectors, seen as the symbols of federal oppression, became targets of harassment and violence. More more than just like the tar and the feathering. Um, One of the first incidents involved John uh, Neville, who is a prominent landowner and regional tax inspector. And in September 1791, a mob attacked (laughs) Neville's home and demanded that he resign his position and cease his tax collection efforts. And with a name like Neville, you really had to pick like a, like a fucking stick your nose in someone else's business job. Especially if your name's fucking Neville. Are you kidding me? It'd be so easy for me to punch you if your name was Neville. I'm not, whoever, I'm sorry if your name is Neville out there, but God damn it, you, you should know. You should know who you are. And you should understand that your name has some certain connotations to it of just being like a little, you know, nosy neighbor. And uh, that's essentially what this fucker was. He was a nosy neighbor. He was like, hey, are you paying, are you paying taxes on that whiskey? <laughs> and uh, when Neville refused, the situation escalated into a very violent confrontation. Uh, they set fire to his fucking house. And in the ensuing chaos, several people were injured. Luckily, no one died as far as I could, you know, find. But still. God damn, like they were, they were pissed about this, man. Such incidents were not isolated. Throughout the whole RAS region, tax collectors continued to face threats, intimidation, and physical violence. They just get the shit kicked out of them, tarred and feathered again. 
Um, <clears throat> and, you know, just to kind of paint a picture, if you don't know what tar and feathering is, this is a humiliating punishment that involved being stripped naked, covered in hot tar. Uh, not enough to like give you third degree burns. Sometimes, sometimes it would be. And then rolled in feathers. And this, this served as both a deterrent uh, to the tax collectors and a stark symbol of the farmer's defiance. You know, by turning them into human fucking chickens, basically. <laughs> in one notable case, a tax collector named Robert Johnson was captured by a group of masked men who tarred and feathered him before riding him out of town on a rail. So, you know, they sent him home, tarred and feathered. Like, God damn. <clears throat> so it was not just confined to physical acts of defiance, however. Uh, farmers also used legal and political channels to oppose the tax. They did it the, you know, I guess, correct way, the way that you should, and organized petitions and sent delegates to Philadelphia to present their grievances to the federal government. In one petition, they argued that the tax was a, quote, direct violation of their rights and affront to their liberty. I should be able to get fucked up and not have to pay the government a single dime off of the, the whiskey I make. God damn it. Uh, they also claimed that the tax disproportionately affected small producers and frontier communities, which were already struggling economically. Like they didn't have the money to pay this fucking tax. But America really fucking needed the money. <laughs> so the federal government, under the leadership of George, George Washington and uh, Alexander Hamilton, were, they were still determined to enforce the tax and uphold federal authority. They're like, God damn it, our dick is bigger. Yeah, make sure that these uh, assholes know that, okay? Hamilton, in particular, saw this resistance as a direct challenge to the authority. And with that being said, he decided that uh, it was time to, you know, get, to get a little more people involved get a militia involved. And in 1794, we have the first escalation to true, true violence. The conflict over the whiskey excise tax reached a boiling point in the summer of, 19, uh, of 1794, not 1994. That would be really funny. <laughs> it's actually closer to the whiskey war, the modern whiskey wars that we'll be going over at the end of the episode. And it's like 1990s. Anyway, <clears throat> in the summer of 19, uh, 1794, God damn it. Years of mounting tension and escalating resistance culminated in a violent confrontation that would become known as the Battle of Bower Hill. This clash, which took place in western Pennsylvania, marked the peak of the quote-unquote whiskey rebellion and had significant implications for the young United States. By July of 1794, frustration among the frontier farmers had reached their, bo- like, just the critical point. They were fucking done. It was, it was over. You know, Alexander Hamilton was a fucking tyrant. They were cool with Washington when they first elected him, but now they weren't cool, cool with it. And <clears throat> the persistent efforts of the federal government to enforce the excise tax were met with increasing hostility, and General John Neville, you know, the guy who had his house burned, the regional task, tax inspector and a staunch supporter of the excise tax, became a central figure in the conflict. Neville's, Neville's attempts to collect the tax and his refusal to back down from his duties made him a target for the rebels. So... <clears throat> On July 15th, tensions erupted when Neville attempted to serve writs of summons to distillers who would not pay the tax. And uh, <laughs> accompanied by a small detachment of soldiers from Fort Pitt, Neville arrived at the home of William Miller, a farmer who had defied the tax. When Miller and his neighbors resisted, a violent confrontation ensued, resulting in the deaths of several men and the wounding of others. The next day, a larger group of approximately 500 armed men, many of whom were part of the Mingo Creek Association, gathered and marched to Neville's estate, known as Bower Hill. The mob, angered by the previous day's violence, uh, determined to make a stand against the federal authority, demanded that Neville resign his position and stop enforcing the tax. Neville, however, was prepared for such an attack. He had fortified his home and secured the assistance of a small contingent of federal soldiers. The confrontation quickly escalated into a full... Full skill battle, a full ass battle. And I bet you his house originally getting burnt down earlier is what made him fucking prepared for this. He was like, hey, doing this shit twice. God damn it. The rebels surrounded Bower Hill and opened fire while Neville uh, and his men returned fire from within the fortified house. The skirmish was intense and chaotic. One of the rebel leaders, James McFarlane, a revolutionary war veteran, attempted to negotiate a ceasefire, but was shot and killed in the process. His death further inflamed the rebels who intensified their assault on the house. 
The battle lasted several hours and resulted in multiple casualties on both sides. Eventually, the rebels managed to set fire to Bower Hill, forcing Neville and his remaining men to flee. The burning of Neville's home was a symbolic victory for the rebels, but also marked a significant ex- escalation in the conflict. The violence at Bower Hill shocked the nation and underscored the severity of the rebellion. The public reaction to, uh, to this battle of Bower Hill was pretty mixed. In the frontier regions, many sympathized with the rebels' cause and viewed the b- battles justified stand against an oppressive tax. Uh, again, something that a lot of these people just fucking dealt with, like not even 15 years ago, right? Like most of these guys fought in the Revolutionary War and uh, probably weren't pretty, ha- they, they weren't too happy about this sort of fucking tax going on. So, uh, <laughs> oh, damn. Uh, the violent resistance was seen as a dangerous challenge to, to the authority of the federal government. Newspapers in Philadelphia and other cities con- condemned the rebels' actions and called for a strong response. The federal government's reaction was swift and decisive. President George Washington, alarmed by the outbreak of violence, convened a special meeting of his cabinet. Alexander Hamilton, in particular, argued for a forceful response to quell the rebellion and reassert to federal authority. Washington agreed and decided to call up the militia force to suppress the uprising. A proclamation issued August 7th of 19, uh, 1794, Washington declared that the rebellion posed a threat to the rule of law and stability of the nation. He, he called on the rebels to disperse and return to, uh, to their homes, warning that those who continued to resist would face severe consequences. His decision to mobilize a militia of approximately 13,000 men from several states demonstrated the federal government's resolve to enforce its laws and maintain order, damn it. They were, they were going to fucking make these assholes pay the tax if they had to, like, pry it from the cold dead fingers. And so <laughs> this is where it gets gets a lot more intense right and in, then in october of 1794 president george washington took an, the extraordinary step of personally leading a militia force partway to western pennsylvania to quell the whiskey rebellion this marked the first and only time in american history that a sitting president has led troops in the field washington's decision underscored the gravity of the situation and his commitment to enforcing federal law the mobilization of the militia was a massive undertaking. The force comprising of approximately 13,000 men was drawn from New Jersey, Maryland, Virginia, and Pennsylvania. The scale of the operation reflected the federal government's determination to suppress this goddamn rebellion to restore order. Damn it. It's honestly kind of like a precursor to, <laughs> to the civil war. The troops were commanded by general Henry light horse, Harry Lee, a respected revolutionary war hero. Washington, however, chose to lead the militia to Carlisle, Pennsylvania, to personally review the troops and boost their morale. And so on September 30th, Washington departed from Philadelphia to join the assembled militia. Governing him were the Secretary of Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, and other high-ranking officials. Because Hamilton was all about that shit. He was like, we're getting, like, listen, no, we have no other fucking way to get money for this, you know, and we're, we're in deep shit, so <laughs> I need to make sure that we're collecting the money, goddammit. <laughs> Washington wrote, to Hamilton, I am fully aware of the responsibility of this action. The honor and the very existence of our government demand that the laws be executed and the insurgents be subdued. And the journey to Carlisle was arduous, to say the least, with the militia facing challenging terrain and logistical difficulties. Nevertheless, the troops were buoyed by Washington's leadership. I imagine having Washington be with you, you know, the fucker that like brought everyone together, led you guys to like forming a new nation. That would lift up my spirits too, to be honest. If I was by a hero, heroic figure like that, I'd be like, God damn, this guy, he's, he's leading us. We're, we're safe, man. We're good. We're in good hands. In a speech to the troops, Washington emphasized the importance of their mission. He said, quote, the eyes of all America are upon us. We must show that the government is capable of enforcing its laws and maintaining order. And his review of the militia was a decisive moment. It demonstrated this, uh, his own personal resolve as well to enforce the, this new nation's laws, to make sure that the federal government was strong, you know, and to make sure that the rebellion wasn't a thing. Gotta put that shit down quick, right? You just, you just got over leading a rebellion. Now you have to make sure that everyone that was part of that rebellion is still part of that fucking rebellion. And as the militia advanced, the mere presence of such a formidable force had a significant psychological impact on the rebels. Many, many of the insurgents, realizing the futility of their resistance, fled or went into hiding. 
the show of federal power was sufficient to quell the rebellion without major conflict. You just had to get enough men and enough guns pointed at people and they'd finally be like, okay, fine. (laughs) I don't really have the money to do this, but here you go. The rebellion's leaders who had once defiantly resisted the excise tax now find themselves on the run or surrendering to federal authorities. Um, and one of like during the march, they would actually go on to capture several prominent rebel leaders, including David Bradford and Bradford, who had been one of the most vocal opponents of the excise tax fled to Spanish controlled Louisiana to avoid capture. His flight symbolized this collapse of the organized resistance. Other leaders such as James McFarlane, uh, who had been killed during the Battle of Bower Hill, were no longer able to rally the insurgents either. So they're kind of shit out. Of, they didn't have like a Jimmy, their cousin, you know, like uh, Jimmy fucking McFarland was not as a good orator as James McFarland and thus was not able to incite the same sort of rage and hatred uh, that James and goddamn motherfucking David Bradford were able to do. <laughs> so they would march through Ruston, Pennsylvania, largely unopposed, as most of the rebels had already dispersed. Uh, the federal troops conducted several searches and arrests, but faced little resistance. Again, really, it's just like an overwhelming show of force that just fucking took over. And this successful suppression of the West Whiskey Rebellion would be a very significant milestone in the young U.S., uh, good old U.S. of A., it really demonstrated the the current federal government's ability to maintain order, which is important because if this whiskey rebellion had gone any further, it would have showed that the country was weak, that the nation was weak, which would have made, you know, people like England, who is probably still a little pissed off about losing, um, you know, France, who we owed a bunch of money to, or Spain, who was literally bordering us at the time. Um, Same with France with some of the areas that they owned. Would have been like, oh man, we could probably just take these fuckers over. <laughs> would have been would have been real bad. So putting down the, the rebellion was a good thing. At at the end of the day, so, especially for the time, the time that they were in, I don't necessarily agree with like taxing poor farmers or you know small businesses. Essentially, an extra amount, <laughs> even though it's supposed to they're they're supposed to be taxing based off of like scale of production. So like. Overall, like the people who produced more were paying more, but they just were taxed a little less um, because like if they taxed them the same amount, then they would have had to pay like, you know, oodles, oodles more. So, you know, but then you could argue is like those people have the money and they have the means that to to pay that tax. But the smaller distilleries definitely didn't like they didn't have that money to pay that tax. And so they sh- it should have just been looked at like, OK, like what is their take home? They, there should have been more thought put into it other than just hey you know like nine cents for these guys and seven cents for these guys <laughs> like that two cent difference kind of seems like bullshit to be very very honest with you be very frank um <clears throat> the immediate aftermath of the rebellion saw the federal government taking measures to stabilize the situation in western pennsylvania and other affected areas uh President Washington is November 19th, 1794 proclamation declared the insurrection over and affirmed that the laws of the United States would be enforced. He expressed gratitude to the militia and the citizens who supported the government's efforts, emphasizing the importance of upholding the rule of law. The prompt, he quote, he says, the prompt and patriotic exertions of our citizens have been the means of repressing the insurrection and securing the peace and good order of the community. The government's response to the rebellion sent a clear message that armed resistance to federal laws would not be fucking tolerated. You will get your ass kicked. God fucking damn it. And the South really did not learn this lesson. It's not, a, you know, like, not even like a century later. Well, not even, a, yeah, not definitely not even a century later, like 50 years, 50 years later. God damn. Shit. Shit would still be going on. <laughs> resistance to federal authority. They did not respect their authority, God damn it. This had a very calming effect in other p- potential insurrections and reinforced the legitimacy of the central government. Many Americans, particularly in the more established eastern states, view the government's actions as necessary and justified. Newspapers and public figures praised Washington's leadership and the militia's ap- effectiveness in quelling the rebellion. However, the rebellion also highlighted the deep-seated regional and economic tensions within the country. Again, 
it's a very, very big precursor to the civil war. <laughs> like I, I wish it would have like, when I was doing the civil war, I wish I would have like read about this and known about this. Cause this is a, this is a very, again, federal federalist versus anti-federalist just gr- battle here and demonstrates like just how long and you know, how people have viewed free freedom in this country differently, you know, just since its inception. <clears throat> Frontier farmers and distillers uh, continue to view the excise tax as unfair and burdensome. Despite the government's success in suppressing the rebellion, the underlying grievances that fueled the resistance did not disappear. The tax remained deeply unpopular in many rural areas where whiskey was a crucial part of the local economy. And so... The ability, the federal government would eventually gain the ability to collect the excise tax. Um, well, kind of. It, it, it didn't significantly improve. Many small distillers continued to evade the tax and enforcement remained challenging, particularly in very remote frontier regions where just the logistical difficulties of collecting tax combined with the ongoing local resistance meant that the revenue generated from the excise tax was far less than initially anticipated. So Recognizing these challenges, Alexander Hamilton and other federal officials continue to advocate for the importance of the excise tax as a source of revenue and a symbol of federal authority. However, this would <laughs> continue to gain more and unpop- become more and more unpopular, especially as like the rich people who were cool with paying the tax at first started to realize, oh, I could make like a lot more fucking money if I didn't have to pay for this tax right here. Uh, so... <laughs> In the early 1800s, political changes and shifting priorities led to a reevaluation of the excise tax. The election of Thomas Jefferson in 1800 marked a significant shift in American politics. Jefferson and his Democratic Republican Party were staunch opponents of many of Hamilton's financial policies, including the excise tax. They viewed the tax as an overreach of federal power and a burden on the agrarian economy that formed the base of their support. Jefferson's administration moved quickly to repeal the excise tax as part of a broader effort to reduce federal authority and promote states' rights. And in 1802, Congress officially repealed the whiskey excise tax, ending one of the most contentious and divisive policies of the early republic. The repeal was met with relief and approval from frontier communities who saw it as a victory for their cause. The end of the excise tax also reflected a broad shift in American politics toward towards a more decentralized federal structure and greater emphasis on individual states rights um in addition to this they also just didn't need the money as much anymore uh they were uh, america was doing it was getting healthier i wouldn't say it was like amazing but it was definitely in an upswing they're in an upswing from where they were at in like early 1790s okay the legacy of the whiskey rebellion and the federal response has had lasting implications for the u.s it established the principle of the federal government <clears throat> had the right and the ability to enforce its laws, even in the face of significant resistance. This precedent would be important in future conflicts and interactions, including the nullification crisis and of the 1830s and the Civil War. So, and that's kind of where, that's like the first time America decided to fuck with people's drinking, you know, fuck with their partying. Uh, let's go ahead and go into the second time and probably one of the more controversial times uh, where this has happened, and that would be the prohibition in the 1920s. <clears throat> the good old prohibition. The dawn of, the 19, of 1920 marked the start of one of the most ambitious social experiments in American history. Prohibition! Woo! The shit, man. Uh, don't you just love religion? <laughs> This era was characterized by the federal government's attempt to eliminate alcohol consumption through legislative action. The 18th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, ratified on January 16th of 1919, came into effect on January 17th of 1920 and prohibited the the manufacture, sale, and transportation of alcoholic beverages. The Volstead Act, passed by Congress in October of 1919, provided the framework for enforcing the sweeping ban. The main cause of the Volstead Act coming into <clears throat> fruition was because of uh, the congressman who originally wanted this passed. And uh, the, the story that came about later after the prohibition was over was that James Volstead was a heavy drinker and accidentally slept with a man and was exposed for it while drunk. 
Um, he also apparently had other, you know, several other times slept with men while not drunk. But uh, the time that he got caught was because he was drunk and was like, hey, you know what? Listen, the, uh, alcohol causes rational, normal men like me to lose their mor- morals. And uh, please, please don't think that I'm gay. <laughs> like, no, no, I'm, 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 I'm fucking with you. That would be that would be hilarious if it's just like some closeted dude uh, slept with someone while drunk and. <laughs> slept with a dude and got caught and was like, oh, it was, it was alcohol. It was the demons and the alcohol that made me suck his dick. Like, <laughs> Now, the roots of the prohibition lay in the temperance movement of the 19th and early 20th centuries. Temperance advocates driven by a mix of re- religious fervor, social reform uh, <clears throat> ideals, and a desire to combat the social ills associated with alcohol. And, you know, your husband's beating you campaigned vigorously for a nationwide ban on alcohol. Groups like the Women's Christian Temperance Union, WCTU, who definitely weren't doing this just because they were tired of their husbands beating the fuck out of them <laughs> while drunk, and the Anti-Saloon League, the ASL, were at the forefront of this movement. Francis Willard, a leading figure in the WCTU, captured the sentiment of many reformers when she declared, Temperance, while a duty is neither our first nor our highest duty, it is a means to an end, a higher end than itself. It is a step towards the establishment of a Christian civilization and from Richard stopping beating me. I'm tired of it. I come home with bruises every day. God damn it. He meets me. While I'm out getting food for us and he hits me and I'm sick of it. Something like that. She said something like that. The ratification of the 18th amendment was a significant victory for the temperance movement. The amendment stated, quote, after one year from the ratification of this article, the manufacture, sale, or transportation of intoxicating liquors within the, import, uh, within the importation thereof into or the exportation thereof from the United States and all territory subject to the jurisdiction thereof for beverage purposes is hereby prohibited. However, the amendment left the specifics of enforcement to subsequent legislation, which came in the form of the Volstead Act. Named after Andrew Volstead. See, I didn't even fucking say that right. Volstead, (laughs) the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, the Volstead Act defined intoxicating liquor as any beverage containing more than 0.5% alcohol by volume, volume, volume. Oh, my God. Uh, Volume. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I can say volume. Why does it sound weird to me? What the fuck? The volume the volume, the volume, volume. Oh my God. I, can I not say volume? Oh my God. No, no. I just learned something about myself. Guys, you're watching me like have like, well, listening to me have a fucking crisis right now. (laughs) Volume. Oh my God. God, I'm going to leave. I'm going to leave that word alone. The strict definition went beyond. God fucking damn it. Went beyond what many temperance advocates had initially envisioned. As even mild alcoholic beverages like beer and wine were included in the band. So like, wait, fuck that. Wait, no, no, no. <laughs> Listen, Richard beats me and I, I need my wine. <laughs> I need my wine at least so I can deal with it because he'll probably still beat me while he's not drunk. The Volstead Act also outlined the penalties for violating prohibition and established the legal framework for enforcement, including the creation of Prohibition Bureau within the Treasury Department. And many of you can imagine what the public reaction was. Um, well, it was kind of mixed because the temperance advocates celebrated the advent of what they saw as a new moral order and, you know, Christians who are all like, yes, and Jesus, Jesus doesn't want me to drink, even though he drank wine and literally turned water into wine. He, he doesn't want any of that. God damn it. Urban areas in particular, where drinking culture was more entrenched, saw significant resistance. A New York Times editorial from January 17th of 1920 re- reflected this ambivalence. It said, quote, the question of how thoroughly the, the American people are going to obey the 18th Amendment has not yet been answered. It is a profound moral question, but it is also a practical question. Damn it. I just hit my fucking mic while I was doing that because I, I had to do the finger pointing <laughs> to get in, get into the mood. Despite the initial enthusiasm among supporters, the enforcement of the of prohibition proved to be a daunting task. The sheer scale of the endeavor, coupled with the widespread Public resistance made effective enforcement nearly impossible. The Prohibition Bureau was chronically underfunded and understaffed, with fewer than 1,500 agents tasked with enforcing laws across the entire fucking country. Mainly because, like, the president and other people like the president 
wanted to fucking drink. <laughs> we're like, uh, did we seriously pass this shit? <laughs> Many of these agents were poorly trained and susceptible to corruption, probably because they also like to fucking drink as the lu- lucrative illegal alcohol trade offered substantial bribes. As prohibition took hold, this illegal production and distribution of alcohol known as bootlegging became rampant. Speakeasies, secret bars, and that sold alcohol illegally proliferated in cities and towns across the country. Organized crime syndicates, seeing the immense profit potential, quickly moved to control the bootlegging industry. Figures like Al Capone in Chicago built criminal empires on the back of illegal alcohol and importing it from Canada, mainly. This impact of prohibition was profound on American society and very, just very, like, uh, how do I put Very mixed, (laughs) like, in its profoundest, really. Uh, While alcohol consumption was initially declined, it soon rebounded as the legal sources became more prevalent. Uh, The rise of organized crime, the widespread disregard for the law, and the social and economic costs of enforcement led many to question the wisdom of the ban. Kind of like weed, (laughs) you know, the fucking, why buy in weed when it just seems to cause more crime? (laughs) Really, why buy in banned drugs? Why not just try to help people who have drug addictions (laughs) instead? Legalize it all, and then, you know, the people who aren't going to do drugs still aren't going to fucking do drugs. If you make it, like, more accessible and, um, you know, well, I guess more regulated in a way, then it's <laughs> it's going to be a lot harder for kids and other people to get a hold of the drugs than it is now. Uh, drug peddlers probably want kids to get hooked on it, so they have a lifelong fucking addict to mooch off of. So, you know, it's... Anyway, eh. Anyway, so the same sentiment and these people felt in the 1920s that I feel now uh, results in a lot of people starting to call for the repeal of prohibition. However, let's kind of get let's go back a little bit. Let's go back into the rise of bootlegging speak uh, speakeasies because this is this is uh, the fun shit as bootlegging quickly became a widespread and very, very profitable activity because the legal avenues for alcohol production and distribution were just cut off many individuals and organization turned to illegal means to uh, to meet the continuing demand you know my uncle jim he needs to get fucking drunk or he's gonna kill us (laughs) he still has scars from (laughs) scars from the fucking the war man from the first with the world war one from the great war Bootleggers smuggled alcohol into the United States from abroad produced it domestically in hidden distilleries and distributed it through a complex network of underground channels The smuggling routes often involve bringing liquor from Canada, the Caribbean, and Europe, using fast boats and ingenious concealment methods to evade law law enforcement. Uh, Such uh, concealment methods was actually the first time of using your prison pocket. Um, I shit you not. (laughs) That was one way of evading it up. Uh, What you would do is you get a bottle of alcohol and honestly, you'd think, oh, but like Tyler, it's going to fucking crack in there. If you've actually held like a beer bottle in your hand, it's kind of fucking difficult to break. It's not going to just shatter inside. So what they do is they just get like a bottle, shove it up there and get, you know, get like 10, 20 dudes to do it. Keep shoving them up their asses. And then they just kind of, you know, slide it out once they got, got into the area that they were supposed to. And, uh, they, they weren't thinking to check up the asses yet back in the 1920s. Uh, (laughs) I'm fucking with you <laughs> no no they, that is not one of the methods no they would um they conceal in like gas tanks um they would make little compartments or uh little like un unnoticeable spots to like hide the booze and uh it was just it, there was a whole bunch of different methods but it was mostly just like con- uh, concealed uh compartments in like suitcases or uh you know having it hidden in like other bottles or like separating specific parts of what they needed to make it uh but like broken up so like it was all legal technically like you could bring these legal items in but one combined then yeah you know a bunch of shit like that one of the most notorious figures of this area was al capone a gangster who rose to prominence in chicago capone's criminal empire was built on bootlegging and he quickly became one of the most powerful and wealthy men in america his organization controlled the protection, transportation, and sale of illegal alcohol, generating immense profits. Capone's operations were not limited to bootlegging. They extended to other criminal activities such as gambling, prostitution, and extortion. 
So you're going to do one sin. Why not do them all? God damn it. His dominance in the Chicago underworld was marked, uh, marked by both his business acumen and his ruthless approach to limiting rivals. You know, like the Valentine's day massacre, just fucking it's, it's the mob, right? It's the mafia coming out from this to control the shit. And the pr- proliferation of speakeasies, which were illegal bars, rock holes sold was a direct response to prohibition. The establishment establishments often operated behind unmarked doors, requiring a password or secret knock for entry. You had to know someone to get you in. Um, and this is honestly kind of like the coolest part from this era. Cause uh, we still have speakeasies in today's time and they are some of the best bars in the world, but they will also charge you up the fucking ass. Cause they usually don't have a menu and they'll just be like, yeah, that's like 20 bucks and I'm like 20 bucks for like, what was basically a shot. It was like a fucking mocktail shot and you're going to charge me 20. God damn it. Um, some, some speakeasies. There's a, there's a couple that I've been to that wouldn't recommend uh, not here in Utah. Uh, in, in Washington, there's a couple. There's, there's a couple in, in Western Washington. So just if you have questions about it, you know, just I'm not going to I'm not going to just outright say it on the podcast. God damn it. But there's a few in there. If you go to them and they charge you 20 for what is basically shot, then you know what I'm talking about. OK, <clears throat> speakeasy is very and they might have just not liked me. That's the other thing too. They, I mean, they, cause like without a menu, they can just be like, yeah, yeah, I don't fucking like this guy. 20 bucks or yeah, this guy's cool. You know, yeah, it's, oh yeah, it's five, eight, <laughs> 11. <laughs> yeah. You know, just kind of vary. But <clears throat> these speakeasies varied greatly in style and sophistication, ranging from small, dimly lit rooms to lavish upscale clubs. They became cultural hotspots, attracting not only ordinary citizens, but also celebrities, politicians, and law enforcement officials many of whom were willing to turn a blind eye in exchange for a share of the, of the profits or the promise of a quote unquote good time. You know, Sheriff, uh, Sheriff Rex over there, he likes to get his uh, titties twisted a little bit. He, like, he likes to be, he's, he's really into it when you like come up and he, he like, he doesn't like necessarily have sex with the prostitutes, but he, d- he would like to have two women, preferably Colombian in nature, come up to him, swaying the hips and turning his nipples until they turn purple. And that's actually where the term purple nipple came from. <laughs> Obviously not. Just fucking, just fucking around with you guys. <clears throat> Speakeasies played a significant role in shaping the social and cultural landscapes of the 1920s. Jazz music, which was emerging as a dominant cultural force, found a home in these clandestine venues. Jazz musicians such as Louis Armstrong and Duke Ellington often performed in speakeasies, contributing to the vibrant nightlife and cultural dyn- uh, dynamism of the era. The blend of music, dance, and illicit drinking created a distinctive atmosphere that became synonymous with the Roaring Twenties. Everyone was having a good time until the Great Depression. Then everyone was not having a good time. The competition among organized crime syndicates for control of the lucrative bootlegging market led to a significant increase in violence. Rival gangs fought brutal turf wars to dominate the legal alcohol trade. One of these incidents would be the St. Valentine's Day Massacre which I'm certain many of you know and are uh, quite aware of, but <laughs> I'll just kind of quickly go over it. This is where seven members of Chicago's North Side gang were gunned down in a garage by men dressed as police officers. This event, widely believed to have been orchestrated by Al Capone's gang, shocked the nation and highlighted the extreme violence that had become associated with prohibition. And widely believed, it was Al Capone's gang. God damn it. There's, who else would have fucking done it at the time? Law enforcement struggled to keep up with the skill and sophistication of the bootlegging operations. The Prohibition Bureau, tasked with enforcing the Volstead Act, was underfunded and undermanned. Many of these agents, again, just, they were not trained. They didn't know what the fuck to do. Like, because this has not been done before. So they were just like, I don't know, just come up, come up with the, the book. You know, you, you figure it out. <laughs> God damn it. And so uh, with that being said, when they're, you know, not being given enough uh, funds, enough resources or anything, these, you know, poor agents are going to want to take bribes because they want nice things too. Of course they want nice things. And so they'll take some money, uh, you know, be able to go have fun, maybe go out drinking, have, have a good time like humans have been doing since forever with alcohol. And the widespread corruption and inefficiency within the Bureau made it difficult to comp- effectively combat the illegal alcohol trade. An internal memo from the Prohibition Bureau lamented, quote, 
The resources at our disposal are woefully inadequate to stem the tide of illegal liquor flooding the country. Our agents are outnumbered, outgunned, and often outwitted by the bootleggers, end quote. And the public's response to this rise of bootlegging and speakeasies was, well, some historians may call it complex, while others will just say they were pretty stoked about it. It was pretty fucking cool. (laughs) Especially if you're in an urban area, like if you're in New York City or Chicago City at the time when this was happening, this was the shit, man. (laughs) This was this was fun. Based off of like the photos and everything I've seen, that looked like it was like the Braves of nowadays, basically, where you can go get fucking some ecstasy. You can go, you can go pop some Molly or something and just have a good time. And that's what people use the speakeasies for. Just, just good time to gather, hang out with a bunch of other young folk, uh, usually like yourself, who just want to escape and, you know, dance the night away. And uh, that's, that's what these were for. So a lot of people liked it. Of course, the, you know, the assholes who wanted the prohibition were pretty against it. And as the 1920s progressed, uh, the unintended consequences of prohibition became very, very apparent uh, with these. The only thing they weren't happy about was the rise of organized crime. That definitely pissed people off. They, they weren't cool with that. They're like, oh, man, I wish I wish you didn't have to fucking fun Capone's bullshit to keep this up. But, you know, fucking syphilis and dick rotted brain asshole. <laughs> But, you know, that was the only way to do it back then. It was the only way to have a truly good time out, out, out on the night. Because um, they didn't have video games. They didn't have fucking other things to go do. And even now, video games aren't going to offer you the same escape, the same social gathering, the uh, human need for connection that, you know, going out to like a nightclub or going out to a rave will do. It, you, humans need other humans. We need human interaction. God damn it. And, uh, when you're just kind of forced to stay at home and fucking <laughs> go, go live alone in your apartment and, you know, go to like a gathering and be like, oh, would you like some juice, dear? <laughs> like, it's not it's not the same. It's not as fun. Uh, <clears throat> so as the prohibition era progressed into the mid 1920s, law enforcement agencies would try to intensify their efforts to enforce the 18th Amendment and Volsa Act. However, this continued to prove to be challenging. The government crackdowns marked by high profile raids and arrests revealed both the determination of authorities and the significant ob- obstacles they faced. So <clears throat> one of the primary difficulties in enforcing prohibition was the vast, vast fucking network of illegal alcohol production and distribution. I'm talking like across the entire country. And some of these were just like connected, but they were interconnected through other connections that weren't necessarily directly connected to one gang, to Capone, to, you know, whoever. Right. They were just fucking there selling it to this dude who would then sell it to this dude who then sold it to a dude who specifically knew was going to sell it to Capone. Right. Like you'd be like four or five connections off before you actually hit like a one of the main crime networks. High profile raids and speakeasies and illegal distilleries became a common tactic in the government's enforcement strategy. The raids were often conducted with much fanfare and media coverage to demonstrate the government's commitment to upholding prohibition. They wanted to really, you know, try and, you know, they, they wanted to double down on this bad take, essentially. It's like, um, and I went a YouTuber just like, <laughs> it's like, Hey, I'm going to say this like awful thing. And then, you know, it gets like shat on for it. And then it comes back and essentially just says the same thing over again, but like tries to reinforce the ideas to like why what they're saying is right. Uh, and it's just like, Oh dude, just, just give up. Just like give up already. Come on. And so one notable raid took place in New York City in 1925 when federal agents led by Prohibition Commissioner Roy Haynes raided the exclusive 21 Club. The raid was a media sensation with newspapers highlighting the glamorous uh, patrons and luxurious surroundings of the speakeasy. Haynes declared, quote, We intend to show that no one is above the law, no matter how wealthy or influential they may be. End quote. Despite these high-profile efforts, the effectiveness of the raids was limited. Many speakeasies operated with advanced warning systems, often tipping off owners about impending raids through a network of informants and bribed officials. Corruption within law enforcement was rampant, uh, with many officers on the take receiving payments to look the other way, or even protect the operations of bootleggers, you know, just to ensure, like, hey, you don't fuck with this guy, basically, like, the... I got a police chief. The police chief is going to say, listen, you don't touch any Capone shops. We don't fuck with you. Okay. 
An internal investigation in, in the New York Police Department revealed that numerous officers were complicit in the illegal alcohol trade, leading to widespread public cynicism about the efficacy of the prohibition enforcement. They're like, if, it, if they could get to our upstanding moral officers, the police officers, what's the point then? <laughs> Fucking just make it legal. <laughs> and so the scale of this alcohol, illegal alcohol industry was mind boggling. It was estimated by the mid 1920s that there were tens of thousands of speakeasies in cities across the United States. And in addition to the speakeasies, illegal distilleries and smuggling operations produced and transported millions of fucking gallons of alcohol uh, annually. This, it was just, it was insane to think that you could stop this, especially, you know, since America's inception, people have been making fucking whiskey. (laughs) They've been making moonshine. They've been, They've been doing a bunch of shit with their, with alcohol. And so in the late 1920s, we would see a very dramatic escalation of violence, um, especially by the organized crime syndicates as they continue to fight for control. Chicago with its dense population and significant demand for illegal alcohol became a very heavy focal point for gang activity. It was uh, the city was essentially divided among various criminal factions with Al Capone's South Side Gang and George Bugs Marone's North Side Gang being the two most po- most powerful. Goddamn Bugs Marone. That's a, such a fucking awesome 1920s name. <laughs> like a little mafia name. The gangs engaged in a relentless struggle for control over the city's bootlegging operations, speakeasies and other illicit enterprises. And the competition was marked by frequent and brutal violence as each side sought to eliminate its rivals. Al Capone was often referred to as Scarface. He was a larger-than-life figure who epitomized the era's gangster culture. He was a, he was a gangster, you know? Like, like a 1920s gangster, not a fucking gangster nowadays. Um, which have a very different connotation for. Capone's operations were highly organized and extraordinarily profitable, making him an insanely powerful man. Yeah, who could just basically buy off whoever the fuck he wanted at the time. The success did make him a target for Bugs Marone, uh, who is a formidable opponent and uh, rivalry between the two became a very infamous American criminal history. This is where we get the St. Valentine's Day massacre in 1929 that I already briefly went over. Um, this massacre did have significant implications for both the criminal underworld and broader society. For Capone, it effectively limited much of the leadership of the Northside gang, consolidating his control over Chicago's legal alcohol trade. However, the brazen nature of the attack also drew intense scrutiny from law enforcement and the federal government. So a lot of people were kind of pissed that he did this. He's like, they're like, listen, if you're going to do this, do it quietly. The fact that you did like this loudly means we can't fucking protect you anymore. And because of that, in response to the increased violence, uh, they decided to turn to uh, <clears throat> the federal government decided to turn to the Bureau of Investigation, which is the precursor to the FBI who work closely with local police to dismantle the criminal networks. One of the key figures in these efforts was Elliot Ness, a young prohibition agent who led a team known as the quote, uh, untouchables. Ness and his team targeted Capone's operations with a combination of raids, surveillance and financial investigations. Their work eventually led to Capone's conviction of on charges of tax evasion in 1931. Again, don't fuck with the IRS. That's the only way Capone got caught <laughs> was, was tax evasion. God damn it. And it was a huge victory for law enforcement. Um, and then by the 1930s, even after getting Capone, public support for prohibition was declining. They're like, listen, this is, you know, it's cool and all that you want, like all of us to be moral upstanding citizens, but I'm, I'm not really all that religious anymore. And I need, I have, I have a lot of, I have a lot of issues from the great war that we fought. <laughs> I need to drink. Uh, so <clears throat> the initial enth- enthusiasm for the 18th Am- amendment, which had promised to eliminate the social ills associated with alcohol had given way to widespread dis- disillusionment, uh, disillusionment because all it did was increase essentially extra social ills. Uh, the people who, you know, were dealing with problems probably just killed themselves or, <laughs> um, who were alcoholics probably still went to speakeasies. So they were still getting drunk. It did not fucking matter. Uh, Making it illegal did not matter. And the fact that we did not learn this lesson 
later for other drugs like weed and you know mushrooms and other you know uh, substances that are now considered legal pisses me off thankfully we are finally starting to get over nixon's war on fucking drugs and i think everyone's starting to realize how much of a mistake that was <sighs> slowly very very fucking slowly so all, all of these events, especially the Valentine's Day massacre, which really made the public just like, like listen, this is because of the prohibition. If, if it was legal, probably none of this would have happened. That, coupled with the economic hardships of the Great Depression, shifted public priority, priorities towards economic recovery and the reconsideration of the federal ban on alcohol because they could have taxed the shit of, out of alcohol again. So the failure... The failure to curb alcohol consumption and its unintended consequences became increasingly apparent throughout the 1920s and the Great Depression, which began with a stock market crash in October of 1929, just completely eroded support for, for it. Yeah, the economic downturn led to widespread unemployment, unemployment, poverty, fin- financial instability. And in the meantime, a lot of these people who were for prohibition realized uh, while they were sad that getting drunk made you feel less sad for a couple hours. Maybe not the greatest way to deal with it, but (laughs) they're like, it's, it's a way to handle this. So in this context, the potential economic benefits from, of legalizing and taxing alcohol became more attractive. Repealing the prohibition offered the promise of generating much needed revenue for the government, creating jobs and stimulating economic activity. An editorial in the New York times in 1930 captured the sentiment Quote, it said, quote, in these times of economic distress, distress, it is prudent to reconsider policies that not only fail in their objectives, but also deny us the means of recovery. End quote. So this really caused public opinion to shift. And the Democratic Party, which had traditionally been more critical of um, prohibition, increasingly embraced the cause of repeal. Franklin D. Roosevelt, who would go on to win the presidency in 1932, made the repeal of prohibition a central part of his campaign platform. Roosevelt argued that ending pro- the prohibition would help revitalize the economy and restore respect for the law. In a campaign speech, he stated, quote, Our nation has experimented with the no- a noble idea, but it has not worked as intended. The time has come to correct this mistake and turn our focus to the urgent task of eco- economic recovery. End quote. Grassroots movements advocating for repeal also gained momentum. Organizations like the Association Against the Prohibition Amendment, AAPA, and the Women's Organization for National Prohibition Reform, or the WONPR, campaigned vigorously to end prohibition. The women were like, listen, I'm, I'm still getting beaten, and I'm tired of it. And at the very least, if I'm getting beaten, I need to get drunk so I can handle it. God damn it. The AAPA... Founded by prominent industrialist Pierre S. Dupont, argued that prohibition was a failed policy that had undermined personal freedoms and fueled organized crime. Similarly, the WNPR, led by Pauline Sabine, a former supporter of prohibition, highlighted. See, I told you, I told you all fucking. It was because they're thinking, ah, our husbands aren't drunk, they're going to stop beating us. <laughs> it didn't fucking happen. So the highlighted the detrimental impact of the ban on families and communities. Sabine famously remarked, prohibition has fostered the very evils it was meant to prevent. It is time to restore common sense and order. You know, oh boy, you know, like either her dad, her husband, someone, someone close to her was drinking and beating the fuck out of her still. It did not matter. Maybe it just like pushed them to drink. So the push for repeal gained significant political traction, and this would culminate in the passage of the 21st Amendment. So the repeal of the Prohibition in 1933 marked the end of this tumultuous era in American history. The 21st Amendment, which was ratified on December 5th, 1933, repealed the 18th Amendment and officially ended the national ban on the manufacture, sale, and transportation of alcoholic beverages. The historic decision was the result of mounting public dissatisfaction with prohibition, its unintended consequences, and the economic imperatives of the Great Depression. The resumption of legal alcohol production and sales signaled a return to normalcy and a significant shift in American and social economic policies. <clears throat> Franklin D. Roosevelt's election in 1932 was a turning point in the repeal movement. 
Uh, the process of repealing prohibition involved the ratification of the 21st Amendment, which was pro- uh, proposed by Congress in February of 1933. The amendment stated, quote, the 18th Article of Amendment to the Constitution of the United States is hereby repealed, end quote. Man, it's that fucking simple to repeal an amendment, apparently. Goddamn. <laughs> it also granted states the authority to regulate the transportation and sale of alcohol within their borders, allowing for a more flexible and localized approach to alcohol control. <clears throat> Bet you the South love that. This provision addressed concerns about states' rights and the ability of individual states to tailor alcohol policies to their specific needs. The ratification process was swift and decisive, and by November 1933, the requisite number of states had ratified uh, the 21st Amendment. Everyone was on board about for this shit. They're like, finally, we get to drink again. <coughs> on December 5th, 1933, Utah became the 36th state to ratify the amendment. Whoo, boy, it took an entire extra month, Utah. Mm, no doubt. Of course it fucking did. Achieving the necessary three-fourths majority and officially repealing the 18th. I'm surprised they didn't hold out, man. They didn't hold out for like another state to fucking just be like, nah. Nah, okay, fine. We'll, we'll do it. I'm sorry. They didn't stick to their fucking guns. Come on. Come on, Mormons. Where you at? <laughs> Should have stuck to your guns here. You... Nah, most of you like drinking too. You just don't like to tell people. The news. <laughs> sorry, not most of you. Quite a few of you. I know you. I know who you are. You know who you are. Look at look at the mirror. The news of the ratification was met with celebrations across the country. In New York City, people gathered in Times Square to toast the end of prohibition. <laughs> Woo, what a way to celebrate. Well, similar. So, it's like, how the fuck did you guys get that while this was still legal? <laughs> the cops probably didn't care who, at that point. While similar celebrations took place in cities and towns nationwide, a New York Times editorial proclaimed, quote, the end of prohibition marks a new beginning for America. It's a, it is a victory for common sense and a reaffirmation of the principles of personal freedom and responsibility. This was, uh, this is a crazy time. People who were out fucking, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Out on the streets, just having orgies over the end of prohibition, right? This is, you know, the, the prude nature of <laughs> our Protestant uh, ancestors to just not hold on when alcohol was flowing through the streets Everyone's getting drunk. They're like, listen, guys, the only thing that can make this alcohol better is sex. <laughs> Man, that, that's basically what happened when, at World War II, though. And, like, after everyone came home, all the dudes came home. It was just a bunch of people fucking for, like, days and nights, basically. I heard, like, there's, like, an entire town where <laughs> all the young men, young women, were just, like, banging. Like, everyone could hear their neighbors going at it. So, you know, I, I, I bet you some, some celebratory fucking was in place. Um, <clears throat> and going along from... From that, we are finally to the Danish-Canadian Whiskey Wars, which started in the 1930s, lo and behold. So in the 1930s, this is where we get the initial dispute between Denmark and Canada, and it was over Hans Island. The origins of the Danish-Canadian Whiskey War can be traced back to the 1930s when a seemingly insignificant island in the Nair Strait between Greenland and Canada became the center of a territorial dispute. Hans Island, a small, uninhabited rock measuring approximately 1.3 square kilometers, lies between Greenland, which was an an autonomous territory of Denmark, and Canada. Its strategic location in the Arctic between Greenland and Canada's El, um, Ellesmere Island eventually led to a friendly but prolonged disagreement between the two nations. The dispute over Hans Island began <clears throat> during the 1930s when Danish and Canadian maps both began to include the island within their respective territories. The ambiguity arose partly because the island sits almost equidistant from the coastlines of both Greenland and Canada. The lack of clear international maritime boundaries in the Arctic at that time further complicated the issue. The initial stages of the dispute were marked by relatively little fanfare. During the early 20th century, the Arctic was a remote and largely inaccessible region, so no one really gave a shit. It would attract minimal attention and compared to other ge- geopolitical hotspots. Again, like, if you can't fucking do anything, no one's going to really care. They may mark it on the map, but it's not like they're doing sh- jack shit with it, right? Nevertheless, both Denmark and Canada were keen to assert their sovereignty over Hans Island due to, due to its location within the Arctic Circle, which was an area of increasing interest for its potential natural resources and strategic significance, but other than that, it just wasn't a big deal. And in 1933, the Permanent Court of International Justice, which was a precursor to the International Court of Justice, 
awarded Denmark sovereignty over Greenland in a ruling that uh, <clears throat> that addressed a dispute between Denmark and Norway. This ruling indirectly impacted the status uh, status of Hans Island as Greenland's legal status was affirmed. However, the court did not explicitly address Hans Island, leaving its ownership unresolved. And so throughout the 1930s and the following decades, the issue of Hans Island remained largely dormant. Again, both nations acknowledged the territorial ambiguity, but the remote and inhospitable nature of the island meant that it was not a high priority for either government. Instead, the focus remained on broader issues related to Arctic sovereignty and resource claims. The early stages of this suit were just characterized by occasional diplomatic notes and correspondence between Denmark and Canada, each asserting their claim. Uh, these exchanges were generally cordial, reflecting friendly relations between the two countries. In a note to the Danish government, a Canadian diplomat wrote, <laughs> I was going to do like a, like a South Park Canadian accent. It's like, <laughs> hey, buddy, while we, claim, while we recognize the close proximity of Hans Island to Greenland, we maintain its <laughs> geographical position within the waters of the Canadian Arctic archipelago that gives us rightful claim. <laughs> Just, uh, just super fast British talking, in my opinion, is what Matt and Trey Parker there do. Uh, <clears throat> so, despite the former claims, the practical um, implications of the dispute were minimal. The island saw little activity. Neither country took a significant steps to establish permanent presence or infrastructure on the island. The lack of economic or strategic urgency allowed the issue to remain low, a low-key diplomatic matter for many, many years. And it wouldn't be until the later half of the, 19th, of the 20th century that the Hans Island dispute began to gain more attention. Much more attention. And in 1973, Denmark and Canada made significant progress in defining their maritime boundaries in the Arctic through the signing of a comprehensive border agreement. This agreement was a major step forward in clarifying the jurisdictional limits between Greenland which again was the Danish territory, uh, the Canadian Arctic archipelago. However, despite the extensive negotiations and delineation of the boundary over a distance of 3,500 kilometers, the status of Hans Island remained unresolved. Yet neither side really knew who the fuck owned this goddamn island. And I bet many of you are wondering, well, okay, Tyler, this is cool and all. It's a fucking island. What does this have to do with whiskey? Well, just wait. We'll, we'll get into that. Whiskey will be important later. So the 1973 agreement was part of broader efforts by both nations to establish clear and mutual recognized borders in the Arctic a region of growing geo. Again, it was, it was growing economic interest. There's a lot of potential for natural resources such as oils, gas, and minerals. Um, and so the importance of the clearly defined territory waters was much more highlighted uh, because of this. And with this being, <laughs> You would think with this border agreement being as extensive and detailed um, as the, you know, with the survey surveys and mapping to ensure accuracy, you would think that they would have gotten the fucking island. But when they came to Hans Island and when they tried you know, trying to decide that the negotiations negotiations would just hit an impasse. Because, again, this was like right there was dead ass in the middle of the Nair Strait. And they it was pretty much even between the two countries, like split right down the middle as to like who would control it. And, uh, they, they just weren't sure about it. Um, and with that being said, both Denmark and Canada would have legitimate claims based on historical usage and geographical proximity and national interest. Both parties, however, at, in the final stages of their, of their negotiations agreed to leave the issue of Hans Island unresolved rather than risk derailing the entire border agreement. Cause they, you know, they liked each other at the time and they're, they didn't want to really, you know, step on each other's toes. They were trying to be polite. This decision was made with the understanding that the border agreement was too important to be jeopardized by the relatively minor dispute over a small uninhabited Island. How Canadian and Danish of them, <laughs> if this was America, America would have fucking bullied them into giving them the goddamn Island. But I, I'm certain that the Dutch, specifically Greenland, where was already dealing with fucking England, like overreaching into their fishing <laughs> for their the waters, which if you listen to that episode a few weeks ago, you know what the fuck I'm talking about. So, oh, man, it's kind of cool how I can just like relate shit like that now. See, guys, learning history is cool because now now I can just like tie shit that other shit that was going on <laughs> into these episodes. Um, <clears throat> so as a result of this. 
The maritime boundary was drawn up on the edges of Hans Island, leaving a small gap where the territorial waters of Denmark and Canada remained undefined. The official documents from, of, from the 1973 agreement reflect this unresolved status. A, Canadi- a Canadian negotiator noted, while we have reached a comprehensive and beneficial agreement on the vast majority of our maritime boundary, the matter of Hans Island remains pending. We will continue to work with our Danish counterparts to find a mutually acceptable <laughs> resolution in the future. Similarly, Danish officials expressed optimism, optimism about the potential for future negotiations uh, to address the island's status. The decision to leave Hans Island unresolved was just pra- it was pure pragmatism uh, back then. In the years following the 1973 agreement, <clears throat> they would both Denmark and Canada maintained the claims to Hans Island, but the dispute remained largely symbolic. It was just you know kind of like a joke. <laughs> Occasionally, diplomatic notes and low-level discussions continued, but there was no immediate. There was no immediate urgency to resolve the issue. They didn't. It didn't really fucking matter. It's just you know between politicians, it was just kind of funny. So again, the island would just see limited activity. Um, you know, both nations occasionally would place flags and other markers to assert their presence. And so, in 1984, this is where the quote-unquote whiskey war would begin. So with this long-standing territorial dispute over Hans Island between Denmark and Canada, this would take a somewhat unexpected and kind of funny turn uh, leading to what would be known as the Whiskey War. The series of lighthearted exchanges between the two nations began when Canadian soldiers planted a Canadian flag on the island and left a bottle of Canadian whiskey. So this is where Whiskey War comes in. Shortly thereafter, Danish soldiers responded by replacing the Canadian flag with a Danish one and leaving a bottle of Danish schnapps. <laughs> this, uh, they're like the Danish schnapps are better than your stupid Canadian whiskey, but I don't know. Canadian whiskey is pretty goddamn good. The, uh, this unusual form of diplomatic interaction marked the beginning of a uh, unique and ongoing tradition. It was just kind of like, you know, dicking around with each other. I began in August of 1984 uh, when the soldiers, uh, Canadian soldiers traveled to Sir Canada's claim over the territory Uh, So they put up uh, some Canadian whiskey and the Canadian flag and then left (laughs) with uh, Denmark continuing it. They then again, put the Danish flag left and along with a note, uh, the Danish along with the schnapps also left a note that read welcome to Danish, (laughs) welcome to the Danish Island. And so it was just kind of like a joke. It was just, you know, it was fun. Uh, This, however, did become known as a whiskey war and it captured both the public's imagination and both Denmark and Canada media outlets in both countries reported on the flag switching and the bottle leaving with a mixture of amusement and national pride. The lighthearted nature of these actions stood in stark contrast to a more serious, uh, ter- to more serious ter- territorial disputes around the world. You know, like Ukraine and Russia, <laughs> you know, shit like that. <laughs> um, And, you know, when it's Canada and Denmark going at it, they're just, you know, giving each other fucking free booze, basically. Uh, A Canadian newspaper described the incident as a cordial and spirited game of flag football in the Arctic. (laughs) While a Danish journalist noted, quote, in the cold, barren landscape of Hans Island, (laughs) warmth and humor prevail over conflict. Man, the 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 Danish are much more uh, a little dreary without a. Start things off in, in the cold, barren landscape of Hans Island. Warmth and humor prevail over conflict. <laughs> like, goddamn, goddamn Denmark. This unusual form of diplomatic interaction continued over the years, with each side periodically visiting the island to replace the other's flag and leave their own national beverage. Uh, these exchanges, although symbolic, served as a reminder of the ongoing dispute and mutual respect between Denmark and Canada. It was just like a, it was a way that kind of dick around and like show like hey we we like we're we're friendly with this country um despite the lighthearted lighthearted nature of the whiskey war both denmark and canada did continue to engage in diplomatic discussions to resolve the status of hans island so really these gestures that were happening were just a backdrop to more formal negotiations aimed at fi- that were aimed at finding a mutually acceptable solution so in the spirit of the whiskey war, these discussions were conducted with an emphasis on cooperation and maintaining a strong bilateral relationship between the two countries, which is great. You know, I didn't want to have like an actual fucking war go down over this. However, <clears throat> in the 2000s, there was a bit of a tit for tat. 
The whiskey war between Denmark and Canada continued with a series of friendly and symbolic exchanges that further, uh, further solidified the unique and good nature, uh, good nature, <laughs> good nature spirit of this territorial dispute. Uh, <laughs> the tradition of replacing flags and leaving bottles of liquors persist, persisted for uh, up in, uh, you know, up into the 2000s, which is crazy. Uh, the decade began with both nations maintaining their respective claims to Hans Island while simultaneously engaging in uh, ritualistic exchanges that had come to define the whiskey war. Each visit to the island was marked by the removal of the opposing nation's flag and planting of their own, uh, accompanied by the gifting of a bottle of liquor, Canadian whiskey or Danish schnapps, uh, which is great. I mean, those soldiers who had to make those runs were probably like, oh, sweet, I'm going to get a little drunk. <laughs> this is great. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to get some free booze. Uh, these extra stories carried out with a sense of respect and humor, ensuring that the dispute remained amicable. The reg- reg- regularity of these visits increased in the 2000s, with uh, both Danish and Canadian officials making trips to Hans Island to continue the, the tradition. It was more of like just a site between the two countries to, you know, be like, hey, this is friendly. One notable visit occurred in 2005 when Canadian Defense Minister Bill Graham visited the island. During his trip, Graham reaffirmed Canada's claim by raising the Canadian flag and leaving behind a bottle of Canadian whiskey. So, like, it, 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 that's how big this shit got. What started out as like a joke, probably just between two soldiers or like a, a platoon and a, a, another platoon <laughs> just turned into this huge thing. The visit garnered <clears throat> significant media attention and was seen as a reaffirmation of Canada's position, albeit in a friendly, non-confrontational manner. In an interview, Graham remarked, Hans Island is a symbol of the strong and friendly relations, uh, relations between Canada and Denmark. Denmark then responded in kind. Shortly after Graham's visit, Danish officials traveled to Hans Island, replaced the Canadian flag with a Danish flag, and left um, behind a bottle of Danish schnapps. The Danish Minister of Foreign Affairs, um, Per Stig Muller, em- emphasized the cooperative spirit between the two nations, stating, quote, Our visits to Hans Island are not about confrontation, but about maintaining our claims with a smile. We respect our Canadian friends and look forward to resolving this matter in the same spirit of goodwill. So, good on them. Good on them. So and it, this is the, the tip for tat. <laughs> I'm sorry if this isn't like you guys were thinking like, oh, fuck, Canada and Denmark. They actually like fought over a smile. And like, are you fucking kidding me? No, no, they were, it was just fun. It's, a lot of this is just like a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> so diplomatic discussions would continue in the background throughout the 2000s. And uh, the spirit of cooperation would persist. And <clears throat> This this is where we get to about 2018. The uh, we finally get to an agreement to negotiate. So they, they're coming towards the end of uh, this little tit for tat here. This little like I'm gonna leave my schnapps. Ha ha! I got you. Uh, <laughs> so this dispute over Han, Hans Island in Canada took a significant uh, step towards formal resolution. Both nations agreed to intensify their efforts to resolve the issue and committed to submitting the dispute to the International Court of Justice, the ICJ. If bilateral negotiations failed, the agreement marked a new phase in the diplomatic process, reflecting the evolving geopolitical landscape and importance of international law resolving territorial disputes, which is good. I, I think that all countries should be a little involved and, you know, everyone should be able to be like, hey, like, because if everyone, all the country's leaders in the world can get together and be like, listen, I agree that these people should like have this land. This is, you know, their area it makes it harder <laughs> for her that country to be like, well, fuck you. Uh, when they know that the entire world is pretty much against them. Um, but then when it divides the world and that's when it causes issues, <laughs> that's, when, that's when world wars start to happen. Um, so the decision to pursue formal negotiations was influenced by several factors, including the growing strategic importance of the Arctic the increasing presence of other international actors in the region and the desire to set a positive precedent for resolving territorial disputes peacefully. They wanted to show that, you know, two nations could do this. And so in 2018, four ministers from both countries met to discuss the path forward for resolving the Hans Island issue. The meeting was characterized by a spirit of cooperation and mutual respect, continuing the tradition of goodwill that had defined the whiskey war in a joint statement. The four ministers declared Denmark and Canada have a long history of friendship and cooperation. We're committed to resolving the Hans Island dispute through peaceful and diplomatic means, reflecting our shared values and commitment to international law. Uh, and so 
<clears throat> Both nations committed to an intensive round of bilateral negotiations to explore all possible options for resolving the dispute. Uh, the negotiations essentially just aimed to find a mutually acceptable solution that respected the, uh, the interests and sovereignty claims of both countries. Uh, you know, just, you know, kind of like think about when you like you're going through a divorce and your mom's like, okay, unless I'm going to have Timmy on you know Tuesday, you can have Tyler on Tuesday. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, you know, separate, separate the, the siblings, uh, that, cause that, that's how you do it. <laughs> yeah, think about it like, kind of like that though. They're, but like in a peaceful manner, that's not, you know, some angry, bitter ex-spouse just like trying to grab everything. These are two people who just like fell out of love and, you know, we're just trying to separate some assets. That's, that's essentially what's going on here. And they, they need some mutual third, uh, you know, some, <clears throat> I guess, unbiased third party to like help them resolve some, some matters. And, but like in a friend really kind of like, ah, you know, like whatever you get, is whatever you get, whatever I get is what I get, but let's, you know, try and like make sure you just, both our comp contributions are being respected here so um and if bilateral negotiations f fail to produce a resolution uh they and denmark and canada agreed to submit to uh, the dispute to international court the international court of justice uh then there were some joint management proposals as part of negotiations both nations considered proposals for joint management of hans island these proposals included the possibility of establishing a shared administration regime scientific research stations and cooperative environmental monitoring programs the joint management approach aimed to foster collaboration and ensure that the island would be used in a manner that benefited both countries and contrib contributed to Arctic sustainability, which is great. You know, that's that is definitely the way I would have thought things were going to go and uh, things were you know going to happen. And so. Uh, and then public and stakeholder engagement. So recognizing the importance of transparency and public support, both governments committed to engaging with stakeholders, including local communities, indigenous groups, and the broader public. This engagement aimed to ensure that the resolution process was inclusive and took into account the perspectives and interests of all affected parties. So in Denmark, the agreement was similarly welcomed as it was in Canada there. You know, everybody was pretty happy about it. They're, they're happy that they were going to finally kind of end this dispute um, even though it had kind of become like a fun tradition at that point. And on June 14th of 2022, after decades of amicable exchanges and, you know, dropping off Canadian whiskey and Danish schnapps, um, they officially resolved their longstanding dispute over Hans Island by agreeing to divide the island equally. Which, uh, yeah, I don't know, this is what they should have done <laughs> from the beginning. The historic, the historic agreement marked the end of the, quote, whiskey war and established a clear shared border running across the small uninhabited island in the Nair Strait. And that brings us to the end of today's historical quarrel. Well, 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 that was a good time. I don't know. I had fun. I had fun with today's episode. It was a very interesting, fascinating, like ex exploration, essentially of like alcohol throughout human history and kind of how it's been used. And <laughs> this episode was originally uh, going to be intended as like a brief 20 minute, you know, like, you know, 10, 15 minute episode between um, in between like bigger episodes. But as I was researching this, I just I started like asking a bunch of questions. I was like, oh, you know what? No, fuck it. Let's just explore the history of alcohol a bit and um, just kind of, you know, kind of go over other rebellions and shit that have happened with booze and kind of turn three smaller episodes into one. So I, ho I hope you guys enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun. Um, if you guys did like like it, please uh, leave a like, uh, leave a review, leave a five star review and just be like, hey, this is the shit. This show is so fucking good that I would... I would kill. I would fucking kill uh, for more of it. Okay. Um, and then, you know, if I ever stop doing the show, I, I, I need you to, 
I need you to own up to your words and uh, fucking kill. Um, preferably not like an innocent person or, you know, really like a person at all. Um, you, you, you can go kill like a deer you know, legally, you know, get, get like a hunting license and do that. Um, I'm not going to be held responsible for anyone murdering someone else uh, that, on this show. That's uh, I'm going to try to not do that. <laughs> but no, if you do like it, um, like subscribe, uh, share it with a friend. Uh, it's the best way to spread the show to get more people listening to it. Um, again, kind of repeating what I said at the beginning. If you guys have any ideas for merch, anything that you want, um, for this show to have, like, I don't know, is there like a character or like, a yeah, uh, is there like a bit that I did that you'd want us to like draw up or something, uh, just stuff like that. Let me know by emailing me at historical quarrels at gmail.com. Um, if you really like the show and you really want to support us, please uh, sign up for the Patreon or I guess Spreaker, which is the podcast distributor platform that I use has like a little like supporters club that we can set up. But uh, right now I have stuff set up on Patreon. I I'm not producing like content for Patreon quite yet. I just, I, <laughs> I mean, no one, no one's over there right now. So, um, Wow. I mean, that's, uh, that's the Amy, you know, it's just really showing up, but like if enough people do show up and like sign for Patreon, I'll probably do like a, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do like a little segment that if you guys were space lizards or something like, like Dan used to do, just have you guys fucking call in and leave messages and shit. Or like, we can just talk about some random stuff, give you a little more insight to like how the, how the meat is made, how I do my tasks here. Um, stuff like that, you know? um, yeah, I don't know. This, I don't know. this is a fun episode for me. This is just, you know, relaxing and interesting. And um, I liked it. I like doing this. I had a lot of fun with this one. I feel like you can tell by how, how excited I got at some points. I mean, I fucking hit my mic like t- 10 times during this episode. So, but hey, I seriously appreciate you guys, though. For real. I, I like I love you guys. My listeners, you guys are the best. Um. I don't know. It's just really cool to see how, even though like right now in terms of like, I don't know what like other podcasts do, like their numbers, the show may be relatively small. Um, the couple hundred of you that listen, um, it's, I appreciate it immensely. Um, I wish I could hear more from some of you guys, but understand like, the, you know, you guys don't want to talk necessarily or like it's, you know, it feels kind of parasocial to do that. But, um, more of you guys are welcome to talk to me too. Like I'm not, again, I'm not going to just like, i be weird. <laughs> like, um, leave a comment, you know, just like I'll, I'll reply. Like, even if it's just a fucking comment, man, you can uh, just like leave a comment on like a YouTube video or, um, on like an Instagram post, or you can just hit me up on Instagram. Um, just historical quarrels. Um, maybe, maybe my personal, well, maybe not my personal Instagram, I don't want people necessarily hitting me up on there. I have pictures of like my kids and stuff and I don't necessarily want that like going public at all. So, um, I mean, yes, they've, their voices have been on an episode of hard homies, but it's not like I, you know, put out a recording of them. I'm not going to do that. So, um, uh, don't need weirdos. Just like, I know none of you guys are weirdos, but in case like a weirdo happens to stumble across it, don't need them to figure out like what my kids look like. So, I would not be a fan of that. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a good time. Uh, but yeah, no, um, if you guys have ideas for the Patreon and you do want to sign up, uh, but you'd like me to start something first, also let me know that, you know, just tell me what you'd like me to do and I'll consider it and put it into my idea jar, try to figure out like a time where I can do it and I'll start working on it. So basically it um i'll see you guys next week uh probably it probably will be a shorter episode next week to be very honest um just because i'm gonna need some time to write this all write up uh what i'm what i'm planning on talking about which i do have a couple ideas i, I know i was going to talk about serial killer i know i said that last week but as i was doing it, i was like ugh, ugh. doing true crime for me is kind of tough sometimes i have a hard time with it but i'll figure out something I have I have more than a few ideas, so it'll be interesting. It'll be fun. It'll be just as fun as this one. So you guys have a good one. I'll see you guys. Well, I guess you'll I won't see you guys, but you'll hear from me next week. Love you all. Bye.